some intellectual historians can afford to forget that periodization was more than a heuristic device in modern empires. Unfortunately, for some of us, that is difficult. Take the too familiar practice of decadal analysis. Which one of us is not in the habit of talking in terms of 50s and 40s? And how many of us have actually thought systematically through the history of this statistical convention? At least I did not 20 years ago. So as a young student, I was very excited to discover in the esteemed pages of the Journal of Social History an article titled, The Strange History of the Decade. An article that promised to offer a history of, I quote, the concept of the decade that has taken hold in today's culture, close quote. The historian, a renowned specialist in North American history of business and labor, did indeed provide a fascinating account of how this trope came to be popularized in the intellectual debates and discussions in Father Seattle, uh, United States, without, however, ever mentioning the institution of decennial census, a practice that the United States government pioneered in 1790. What a missed opportunity, I thought, as I imagined an intellectual cross-hatching of the temporarily adjacent publication of Malthus's essay on the principle of population and the rapid institutionalization of decennial census in the West, a pathway which in the last six or seven years has been so admirably and in much, much more complexity explored in a number of admirable monographs, such as uh, Levitron's uh, Cultural History of the British Census and so on. To think of periodization, this is my point, to think of periodization in a pragmatic vacuum has a function, a critical ideological function. It obscures the travel of techniques from bureaucracy to academy and back. To the extent the issues of scale and rate remain central to modern technologies of rule, it will be irresponsible to speak of cultures of periodization without a reckoning of their embeddedness in the mundanity of governance. In spite of its many problems, we are immensely indebted to Catherine Davis's 2008 volume, Periodization and Sovereignty, for making this issue once again visible. In this book, and also in the significant anthology, Medievalisms in the Postcolonial World, that she co-edited with Nadia Altschul in 2009, Davis pushes the thesis that the history of periodization is juridical, and it advances through the struggles over the definition and location of sovereignty. This, too, is a universal history. I would like to remind my colleagues with a Hadarian chuckle. This history of co-production, if I can appropriate the term that came up many times in yesterday's roundtable, is less happy though. The deep imbrication of imagining a feudal middle age in Europe and the land settlement in colonies, Davis and her associates mercilessly show, has been historically interdependent and co-constitutive, as was the triumphalist narrative of a secular modern. Yes. A universal history, but with remainders. Things do not translate smoothly, do not fit perfectly, do not cross map exactly onto each other. How about a universal history of remainders? I want to flirt with this idea today, building on and complicating Davis's provocative argument that the disciplinary protocol of periodization in history also functioned as part of a wider liberal juridical technology in post-Enlightenment Europe. What I choose to focus on, though, is a category that will be difficult to readily dismiss as a simple instrument of one-sided colonial violence. Across the world, this category has been taken up with much vigor and political energy by explicitly anti-colonial groups for real-world fights against dispossession and marginalization. And yet, its colonial provenance is rather indisputable today, after at least three decades of painstaking work by historians such as Martin Chanak in Southern Africa, Daniel Lev in Indonesia, or Niladi Bhattacharya in South Asia, to name randomly only three scholars out of at least 100 working on the colonial construction of customary laws. The category is since time immemorial. 
Most professional historians today would look at this imprecise description with suspicion. While most professional lawyers in the Anglophone world would consider this bread and butter. Out of the many landmark verdicts that turned crucially on this category, I will quickly remind you of three. Mabo versus Queensland in 1988 and 1992, where the High Court's decision not only recognized native title in Australia for the first time, but also radically altered the ground of all intellectual discussions about settler pasts in the country by undermining the official doctrine of terra nullius, culminating in the widely known Australian history wars. Two, the Semirite and Emergy versus Kenya in 2010, where the African Commission on Human and People's Rights ordered the state of Kenya to financially compensate and to restore the Endorah's people to their historic land from which they were evicted in the name of development. Not only is this regarded as the first ruling of an international tribunal to find a violation of the right to development, it is also the first ruling to determine who the indigenous peoples in Africa are and what their rights to land should be, entailing, as you can imagine, significant intellectual and political arguments and disputations across the continent. Three, more recently, in 2014, Shilkoti Nation versus British Columbia in Canada, where again, the acknowledgement of the land title for the Athabascan speaking First Nation, the relationship between all provincial legislatures and the Canadian logging industry underwent substantial modification. In all these verdicts, as in many other hundreds across the world, since time immemorial has been a crucial, one might even say the clinching part of the legal argument for establishing Aboriginal, Indigenous, Native, First Nation title rights. This legal historical description became generalized across different parts of the 19th and early 20th century British uh, Empire through a strange series of conceptual developments that I will soon briefly allude to. What I would like you to notice at this point is the fact how, besides its casual deployment in the historical and anthropological literature for a whole range of histories, both metropolitan and colonial, the category became quite central to the process of codification of customary laws of the communities usually catalogued as tribes and aborigines in Burma, India, New Zealand, and Southern and Eastern Africa. With the, shadow, with the shadow of Native American treaties looming large over it. Straddling the contradictory demands of durationality and indeterminability, since time immemorial was made to perform a set of epistemological and institutional works in the colonial empire that I contend is best captured in the description of an anti -period. Why? Because fundamental to the conventional epochal imagination of historicist time are closure, succession, and supersession. Even a Hegelian alphabet, right? The period has to be determined, demarcated, it has to be a unit, then it has to be succeeded by another period, right? It has to change. And then you, it has to, if you are a good Hegelian, as most of the good 19th century people are, then you have to overcome it while preserving uh, what is positive in it. In operationalizing a notion of the past that could neither be denied nor delimited, since time immemorial introduced and activated an apparatic restlessness at the heart of this imagination. It simultaneously acknowledged and put under question the indexicality of the past, playing off a radical undecidability between the mythical and the historical, and making possible a discursive infrastructure of indigenous subjectivity shared across the statist and the communitarian articulations. This, in short, is my claim. In order to illustrate this claim, since I do not have the time to go into the details of the massively complex chronology and the vast geography of categorial circulation across the empire, let me make three short observations which may be used for a general discussion. One, in emphasizing the structure of the juridical and the historiographical, I'm trying to think of periodization less as a universal narrative practice with culturally variant forms, which assumes pre-existing identities, 
predefined traditions and territorialities and predestined projects, then as a technique through which specific materialities of time were generated, sustained, and from time to time hollowed out. This requires, among many other things, a retemporalization of the very notion of the state. In the book I'm writing, I deliberately term the question as the seasons rather than the reason of the state. In most of these geographies, deemed remote and inaccessible by the metropolitan state, the periodic nature of the physical presence of government officials and officials necessitates a very different analytic than what we use today. You know, I don't have, I can't go into the details, but most of these communities share a history of violent forced sedentarization. And to insert the question of temporality and rhythms into the abstract notion uh, of a seamless colonial state and um, you know, to examine the punctured, precarious, and materially mediated character of colonial power as it came to be exercised in company and in competition with a variety of other rhythms, such as floods, fires, Sweden's migrations, and trades in these regions. One need to think about the massive calendrical reforms in most of these regions, abolishing um, other forms of temporal calculations, and obviously, you know, emptying the moral connotations of the temporal terms, introduction and pumping of money and capital, uh, which was uh, quite checkered owing to the lack of writing for most of these communities. Now, to think of periodization as a technique which somehow, you know, no, which, which where, the, where the government can come back after a regular interval and take stock of and measure the rate of progress of these primitive people, uh, this was the very notion of a particular periodization is already active in the practices of the empire. So rather than the articulation, narrative articulation, I'm, I'm very much more interested in what kind of notions of practiced periodization uh, are taking place within the uh, imperial archive uh, uh, for these communities. And in my understanding, this corresponds to what Foucault calls the unblocking of the art of government from the fulcrum of sovereignty. We can come back to that point. But second observation, in terms of intellectual history, the attention to the material mediation of periodization allows me to spare inflicting on you the familiar theme of denial of coevalness that Johannes Fabian so eloquently articulated in 1983 in his time and the other, where he speaks of the temporal wolf in taxonomic sheep's clothing. On the other hand, recognizing the location of periodization within the folds of governmentalization of the state allows us to problematize the available origin story of the term since time immemorial. Some 60 years ago, J.G. Epoko, in his famous first monograph, The Ancient Constitution and the Feudal Law, pointed at the indubitable centrality and the magical power of time immemorial in the legal thought of 17th century England. He showed how the belief that the laws of the last Anglo-Saxon king had been confirmed by the 11th century Norman conqueror and his successors encouraged confidence in the existence of an unwritten constitution, uh, ancient constitution, reference to which was constantly made, precedents, maxims, and principles from which were persistently alleged, and which was regularly asserted to be immune from the king's prerogative action. Popok's analysis shows how the argument that the courts, parliaments, or the law were in memorial was often in practice identical with the argument that they were pre-Norman conquest. Once over that stumbling block, he writes, the rest may be taken for granted, and all the subtleties of the common law technique of reading history backwards are called into play." Close quote. The whole book is full of examples of such creative readings by 17th and even 18th century historical actors to immunize their new privileges through an ascription of immemorial origins. 
Extending this line of analysis, Stefanielski has recently shown how this trope of time out of mind was indispensable to smuggling in radically novel, subversive, and even insurrectionary ideas in a broader, non-juridical field of writings in early modern England. What is interesting to note here is that in its ability to make an ascent persisting through all time identical to the gradual evolving changes and substitutions that have happened but are not retained by memory. As Sarah Muriel puts it, and I quote, the logic of time immemorial is able to make the English constitution both the elegantly blank state of nature and a deep and densely packed settled sediment of civilization, close quote. Maurer focuses on the mid-19th century project of what she calls exporting time immemorial to India and Ireland. And understandably, her chief protagonist is Henry Maine, a pivotal figure in the customary turn of the late Victorian Empire. Much has been written in the historiography of imperial codification of customary law about the salience of Maine's impact on the legal cultures in both South and Southeast Asia and Africa. What has not been adequately emphasized, though, was the strange affinity between the unwritten constitution of common law England and the savage frontiers, which from the 1880s were strongly, if without much success, encouraged to codify their customary laws. Today, the entire constructionist historiography seems reliant on the easy, untenable distinction between the dynamic lived tradition of the colonized and the fossilizing impulse of textualization by the colonizer. In contrast, the contemporary documents in crown colonies of Natal and Basutoland, in scheduled territories of, in Kantia, Burma, and Central India, in protectorates of Bechuana land, Uganda, and Sarawak, and later in the mandate territories of Tanganyika and Cameroon, display a distinct sense of unease felt by the district officers who were tasked to demarcate the claims belonging to the time immemorial. The common law was after all a customary law, and English legal authorities defined custom in a way which heavily emphasized its immemorial character. To think of this anxiety of intimacy is to think through the constant switch that the frontier officials had to calibrate between a Hobbesian and a Lockean version of the state of nature. Right. You have uh, four minutes. Yeah. So I'll, I'll add it. So, Locked in, locked in perpetual war, these communities' unwritten constitution could not, by any stage of imagination, could be understood as Lockean. These were Hobbesian uh, subjects of uh, these were subjects of Hobbesian state of nature. They were locked in perpetual war, and if they have an unwritten constitution, as one of the officers say, it is a constitution of blood and death. Now, this is where the interesting thing happened. The in the process of the codification of customary law, the importance of repugnancy clause became so crucial, right? So we record and recognize your tradition, which is continuing from time immemorial. In most of the cases, this was just quite like the similar uh, discursive tactic that, that Tokok talks about. So if it was Norman conquest for, uh, for uh, um, 17th century England, then for 19, late 19th century, early, uh, early 20th century New Zealand, it was the time before the Treaty of Waitangi in, in any time before 1840. So once you are, once we record and recognize your time immemorial customs only to the extent that they are considered not repugnant to the Christian modern sensibilities, right? And the huge role of missionaries in recalibrating these customs in order to make them commensurable for modern sensibility is another huge part of the story that you can obviously imagine and I cannot go into. But so, for example, headhunting, cruel mutilation, and slavery had to be excised from a whole complex ritual of uh, complex of rituals and practices, saying that although these definitely had similar proofs or evidences of continuing from the so-called time immemorial, 
these are repugnant to any modern civilized, uh, uh, civilizational protection state. So this cannot continue. And this will be taken out of the entire moral cosmos of customary law. The rest we keep. This is the violence of commensuration that I want to draw your attention to. Because this project, which was perfected by the main inspired uh, uh, kind of frontier officials, one can think of Lugard, one can think of Lubok, one can uh, think even earlier of uh, Theophilus Shepstone in, in Natal, the uh, Hutton in Burma and India, Butler in Burma. Uh, these officials, they were trying to produce this grammar of what is acceptable customary law by reducing, in turn, the very idea of customs as a set of meaningless rituals, some of which people can pick and choose, and some of which we can allow to continue. The entire epistemological uh, dimension of, the, of, of these customs were obviously uh, excised because headhunting, slavery, and cruel mutilation could not be tolerated tolerated by any modern uh, protector state. And this was taken up on a trans-imperial level uh, by the League of Nations in the 1920s uh, through as it kind of uh, divided the question of labor uh, between uh, ILO and, uh, and the slavery committee. And a proprietorial personhood, creating a proprietorial personhood for the aborigin bringing them back from the Hobbesian state of nature to the Lockean state of nature. That seems to be the, uh, the uh, strategic discursive function of this time in memorial. And just finally, two lines, that this kind of brings us to the third and final point, is the impossible prospect of a universal history of remainders. The classical approach, classical imperial approach, was always to cut off. Right to treat it as prehistorical and unprepared for entering the arena of universal history. As Hegel said, even at the present time, we know of peoples which scarcely form a society, much less a state. This prehistorical period lies out of our plan, whether a real history followed it or the peoples in question never attained a political constitution. A more complex maneuver than Hegel's seems to have been in incubation inside the practical epistemic complex of the empire. An anti-period that could be manipulated depending on the specific material exigency of rule into the easy dichotomies of particularity and universality, of community and state, of synchrony and diachrony. The irrelevance of events in this history no wonder made it particularly attractive for the structuralists, who used, by the way, the, these uh, League of Nations uh, uh, authorized officials' expedition reports as the archive for their structuralist theories. VoiceRepublic.com, home to the spoken word.